Big data is coming about because everything we do now is automatically captured. Every corporate activity, every government activity, every personal activity. And the use of that information um, uh, to um, explain and predict um, how our businesses operate, how, how efficiently our government activities work is absolutely critical to, to competitive nature of the world and uh, to optimizing what we do. You know, I think there's been a long historical consensus building on this point over the last half a century. We need to analyze the data uh, that we produce uh, in every activity from product planning through uh, where are our customers, what do they buy, uh, what is our inventory, uh, how is our manufacturing operation feeling, how is our distribution system to be optimized because it makes enterprises and all kinds of organized institutional activity much more efficient. And it's this increase in efficiency and competitiveness that is driving um, all substantially sized organizations to replace armchair thinking and guesstimates and spreadsheets with actually you know, high powered analytics that build statistical models um, that can precisely tell them where things are, how they're going, to explain their business and predict their business. And that's why that statistics has turned into the title of predictive analytics. There are a number of simultaneous revolutions that have happened over the last half a century. One of the first of which is that um, beginning in the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, um, uh, the notion that empirical analysis was the way in which fields of study needed to organize themselves spread from the natural sciences into business schools, into departments of studies of political science, sociology, research and education, and all the way through down to uh, almost every field outside of the core humanities. Um, and that revolution has just continued generation of student and faculty after another. So after you know, 40 to 50 years, um, the notion that that is the way to best understand the way the world operates has become very widely spread. Okay. And I was very much involved in the beginning of that with you know, being on the original team that invented SPSS in the, um, in the uh, late 1960s. Um, second, we have had an explosion of computer connectivity. I mean, what really started out to be about computation ended up being more about connectivity. And so with that connectivity and the emergence of sophisticated software for the storage of data, for graphics, graphical interfaces, for what we call WYSIWYG, um, um, what you see is what you get, point and shoot kind of interfaces, it opened up the computer so that people without exhaustive amounts of training could actually do you know, business intelligence and finally modeling and predictive analytics um, to marry this da data together with their business practices uh, so that they could optimize their efficiency. Expert decision making has always relied on experience and data collection and knowledge in what predictive analytics does, what model build, statistical model building does, is gives the decision maker you know, more information so that his intuition and his decisions or her decisions are more keenly um, uh, made on the basis of, a, of more information. Um, and uh, if one has a hunch, one can then analyze data and see if they, they, can, they can verify that hunch. Um, or in, you know, form that intuition. I, you know, I don't want to take the notion that this is all an automatic process. Both the analysis is an art as well as a science. And the use of that information um, is um, precisely, you know, um, the same uh, kind of cognitive 
filtering that people had before they had that information. It's just now the decisions ought to be more efficient because they have additional information on actually what's going on rather than building a model in their head of what's going on not being informed by data. And that's what caused what I talked about before, this 50-year spreading of statistical modeling across every academic discipline. Because in every discipline, you know, it drove armchair theory, empirical analysis drove armchair theory out of its chair, so to speak. Um, you know, lots of chain stores, major distribution of packaged goods, you know, there are sort of, you know, models that have emerged over the years of where to place products on shelves. But we're working on several projects, unfortunately I can't give you the names of the company, where we are actually able to look at a piece of geography and the aisles and rows and in a store or in a, in, in a, in a retail uh, business situation and actually able to tell um, where the activity is, where the hot spots are, build what we call a flame chart where you know, it's white hot or cool uh, orange or red and be able to, to get a retail organization to optimize what kinds of products it puts where, where are they most likely to optimize on gross revenues, optimize on net revenues, and now all of that data exists because all of these organizations are completely computerized, they know where every sale, they know where it happened, they know when they move something, the things, you know, that item sells more quickly over there, and so if you take long periods of that data, and variation in that data, you can do an enormous amount for that retail company to show them where to put products and what sells with what. All of this becomes possible because you can handle this enormous scale of data down to the individual transaction level and, in spot, and locate it in an individual space. For that, that gives you one example. Oh, I think, you know, I have spent, you know, you've spent my lifetime, I've sort of had two lifetimes, my technical life in, in visioning and building, you know, s software systems for data analytics. Yeah, but my other life has been as a social scientist, as a political scientist, you know, I've written several books that try to explain how people, how the average citizen actually gets involved in politics, wrote a book called Participation in America, which won the Woodrow Wilson Award many years ago, you know, which, which used this kind of data to map out the different ways in which people not only voted but contributed to campaigns, but how they in between elections, you know, what kind of contacts they made with public officials, what kind of communications, what kind of organizations that they belong to that tried to to, um, to affect uh, political decisions and political outcomes so that we had a, you know, a, a great understanding. Uh, and and another, you know, in other works, people are you know, writing books about how important is the standing partisan loyalty to understanding the flow of elections. Uh, Professor Green at Yale has written you know, a book called you know, Hearts and Minds, and it's you know, extremely important. You know, sociologists understand how professions work, how people progress through their professions, how education is used to create social mobility and sort people by occupation and therefore and thereby by income. All of this is made possible by empirical predictive analytics. Remember, we're only 15 years away from the first browser search engine, Netscape. 1994. So it's really been a, you know, an absolutely, you know, and now we're talking about the need to analyze terabytes and gigabytes of data, which is one of the reasons why we've, you know, put these resources into R, Revolution R, Enterprise R to do that, and why we have these marriages between us and the new high-speed MapReduce databases like Hadoop and Cloudera, um, and on and Natiza and all of the other um, uh, uh, um, high-speed databases where we can actually stream in their nodes and provide you know real-time analytics, which ultimately, ultimately, will be data analytic telemetry. I think that's where it's really going. Where it's going, where you don't stop and analyze, 
you're actually analyzing a stream of information like telemetry coming down from, um, from a satellite or uh, um, uh, um, 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 uh, astronauts uh, keeping track of their health. In that ultimately, these will be converted to dashboards on executives desk where they can watch things going on in real time. Um, that may sound like, you know, um, a, um, a vague future, but I, I, this, is, this is all going to happen within the next 10 years. Everything has to begin with a guesstimate in your head about what you think is important, okay? Um, there, are, there are people who believe that you ought to do these things brutally empirically. Just take a giant fishing net and just gather all the data pick some dependent variable like gross revenues or net revenues and just let everything, you know, shake and bake. Um, but I think we've learned over the years that the more, more successful approaches are when you interact back and forth with the data to try and build a model of what's really going on out there in the real world. Whether it's a psychological world, a physical world, a sociological world, or an economic world. And you use the data to inform the theory, use the theory to inform the data, and that's why this kind of interactive back and forth ability, no matter what the scale of the data is, that R is so powerful at, uh, makes it such, a, such an outstanding tool. I mean, if you're an academic doing, you know, research on, on uh, the American electorate, you ask one set of questions. If you're sitting as an executive of a corporation and you say, you know, I have one big fundamental issue, I want, or two or three fundamental issues. What affects my, my market share? What affects my profitability? What affects my cost structure? What affects, you know, this? and then you say, well, that's got to be, you know, I got to have information on this variable, this variable, this variable, and that variable, and then maybe I'll be able to understand it. So again, it's this process of, of starting out with an approximation of what you need and then seeing if you've got a measure. And then what's happened in the last 15 years with the connectivity is the number of measures that we have that potentially explain how profitable we are, you know, how people vote, uh, who goes into what occupation, who does well in school, I mean, all of these things. Um, how, how, how well govern, uh, governments function as redistribution systems, all of this, you know, depends upon all of this data being out there and available. And where I, when I started in the world, you had to create your own data to do a, an empirical study. And now you have to just find the streams of information that are already there and connected and put them into the analysis. And these, high, these big, large databases and data warehouses and um, uh, whether they're the more tr classical relational database models or these new high-speed map-reduced you know, models, um, having those there are development themselves that make it much easier to connect predictive analysis systems like Enterprise R uh, to that data than they were years ago where you had to just struggled to get some data out of your records or you had to go out and create it yourself. Um, the really deep idea to add scale to empirical model building, to go beyond sampling, is of course about how I, what I said before about getting away from the linear approximation and getting it, you know, absolutely right by actually using the absolute values of each variable rather than, than on assuming some kind of linear um, relationship to another factor. But one of the other things that scale allows is the ability not only to do high-speed analysis with a, a predictive modeling package like Enterprise Revolution Enterprise R, but to actually be able to wed that to these very, very large emerging map-reduced databases which can handle gigabytes of information. So while Enterprise R's file structure is meant to get you to, you know, 
millions of observations and hundreds of millions of observations and thousands of rows, getting uh, it embedded in uh, a map-produced um, database system like Hadoop, uh, Cladera's Hadoop, you know, then you can talk about moving from there to terabytes and gigabytes of information that can be monitored and processed.